Welcome, everybody. I'm so thankful you're back with us, uh, joining us for a Revelation study today. Um, today, we're doing Revelation 14, and I've entitled it The Redeemed and the Harvest of the Earth. And that's the main focus of this uh, chapter is really on the redeemed. Starts with the redeemed, uh, but we'll talk about that some more. Uh, there is some focus on what happens with the wicked as well. So before we get started, Tim, could you just okay. please have a word of prayer? Thank you, Lord, for the privilege of meeting together in your name, the name of the gift of Jesus. And thank you, Lord, for continuing to unfold, unravel, uh, uncover all the good things that you have in your word for us to understand, to, to love you more and to be more wholehearted uh, for you and, and for your plans and purposes for us in, in our world. So thank you, Lord, for clarifying and deepening and blessing in every way possible, everyone involved with this study. We love you and we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So welcome again. It is so great having you here in uh, studying well, God's word with us today. So um, we're just going to hop right into Revelation 14 here. Um, let me see. I'm going to make a couple of assignments here. Start with Lynn. You're going to Revelation 14, 1. And Patty, if you could do Genesis 4, 7. And then, Gail, you'll have Revelation um, 14, 2 and 3, and, and let's see, Janice, Revelation 14, no, we have Revelation 5, 5 to 8, <clears throat> and then Tim will be Revelation 5, 9, and 10. So, okay. So, let's just start right in. Uh, the redeemed have the lambs in his father's name on their foreheads and we'll talk about what that means just as soon as we read this chapter first verse in revelation 14 verse 1. go ahead lynn <clears throat> then i looked and there before me was the lamb standing on mount zion and with him 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads okay let's pause there so what do we see the lamb, which we, who is who is the lamb? Jesus. Jesus. And he's standing where? On the Mount Zion. On Mount Zion. What does Mount Zion represent? Heaven. heaven, the kingdom of heaven, because kingdom. mountains have to do with kingdoms and symbolism. So Mount Zion is the heavenly kingdom. <clears throat> And with them, the 144,000, and who were the 144,000? By the way, where did the dragon stand in the last chapter 13? In contrast, the lamb standing on Mount Zion, that heavenly mountain, that kingdom. What do we see? That Where do we see the beginning of Revelation 13? Where is the dragon standing? Land and sea. Shore, seashore. He's on the seashore. That doesn't sound, that sounds like about the lowest spot. You know, you're at sea level compared to a mountain. Just think about that. <laughs> you got a mountain that is strong and high and powerful, and you have the dragon. He's standing at sea level, the shore of the sea. And out, out of that comes the beast. Remember the beast out of the sea. So it's very interesting to me, the study in contrast that we're going to see in this chapter. There's a lot of studies in contrast. And uh, from what we just were studying last time, in Revelation 13. <clears throat> so with the lamb are standing on Mount Zion. That's where the, the 144,000 are standing is Mount Zion, on Mount Zion. 144,000. Who are the 144,000? We studied about that in Revelation 7. Think back. Those are the ones that are redeemed. All the redeemed? Yes, isn't that? I was thinking that it was all of them. Yeah. Old Testament, New Testament, right. all from every tribe of Israel. All of God's people 
referred to symbolically as Israel and all the 12 tribes. As we noticed, there was an exception. There was an exception to the rule too. The tribes weren't even mentioned in the list. Um, and so we know that with symbolism, it wasn't, it says from every tribe and it only has 12 out of the 14 <laughs> that were tribes actually in Israel. So it's very, there was significance about that, but you can go review that if you'd like to on the revelation, the, the, the study on Revelation 7. So the 144,000, all the redeemed, Old Testament and New Testament, and what is written on their foreheads? Right here, Father, Revelation. Father's name. The Lamb's name and the Father's name written on their foreheads. Now, it's very interesting. If you go back to the 144,000, they were sealed in their foreheads, remember? Revelation 7. And sealed means... Um, Preserved. It means a signet, a stamp pressed, a mark of genuineness. <laughs> They're genuinely gods. These are genuine in the new mankind. These are the true and faithful <laughs> servants of God. So they were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, as we talked about in Ephesians. So we see them having that name. Um, <clears throat> in contrast, remember last week we saw the wicked and the mark of the beast, remember? And I'm going to just do a quick review on that just to cover a couple things just to be sure we got it all straight. Mark is, that word mark is Strong's 5480, which is charagma, which means a mark, a stamp, as a badge of servitude. In other words, these are servants, they're slaves, and it's either on their right hand or on their forehead. Interesting. Why was it on the right hand or the forehead? Think about last study we did on Revelation 13. What does the forehead represent? Your thoughts. Your what thoughts. You think, your mind. Yeah. You think, your beliefs, what you have trust in. What does your right hand represent? What, your, what you do, authority what else. You, your actions, your works. <laughs> We're not saved. Notice that the righteous don't have any seal or any name on their hands. <laughs> Theirs is in there only in their foreheads because it's who we believe in. All to do with a choosing to believe. That's it. All what it, Abraham, he chose to obey God, believe what God said, and do what God said. That's what he did. It was a decision he made to be under God. So if you have the land's name and the father's name written on the forehead, what does that indicate? Who you belong that is to. who you serve. Who you belong to. Mm -hmm. Who you belong to. How we think. <clears throat> now, it's interesting that Mark was the name of the beast or the number of his name. Okay. So the, the name of the beast or the number of his name. So they give you have the name of the beast in contrast to God's people having the name of the lamb and the name of the, his father. You have the name of the beast or the number of his name. So we talked about that a little bit. I just want to reinforce about this. Notice it's all about the name, though. It's either the name or the number of his name. Got it? So it's all about the name of the beast, which is the king, which is what? What is the beast out of the sea? The kingdom of? Babylon. Babylon, which is the kingdom of this world. Oh, yeah. Now, there's a clue as to the name of the beast. It says calculate the number of the beast, for it is man's number. Interesting. So the name of the beast, if you calculate its number, it's man's number. So another name you could actually kind of relate to would be calculate. It's man's number. Calculate is Sufizo from Strong's is Strong's 5585. It's to use pebbles in enumeration to compute, to count. <laughs> That's simply what it means. Compute the name. Now, I wanted to remind us of something we talked about way back, and it's going to relate to what we're talking about today. 
as well. But <clears throat> when we talked about symbols in the Bible, I think it was our first lesson in the book of Revel for the book of Revelation, we talked about symbols in the Bible. And part of the symbols are the numbers and how numbers are used in symbolism. And Hebrews practiced gematria and Greeks practiced isosophy, which attributed numerical values for each both the Hebrew and the for the Hebrews or the Greek letters in a name, for instance, or in a word, you could you put a numerical number, and a sosophy is the practice of adding up all those numerical values of the individual's letters in a word, in this case a Greek word, and you take that sum. So, in other words, so the number of the beast is the sum of man added up. In other words, what are the calculations of man, <laughs> mankind in the Greek? You add up all the values of those numbers and it comes to six, six, six. So you could say in a sense that the kingdom of this world is fallen mankind's kingdom. <laughs> you could say that, couldn't you? Mm -hmm. So that's basically you are somebody who's not you but if you were had the mark of the beast you were part of the fallen humanity because that's the citizens of that kingdom is fallen mankind we could call them sinners we could call them wicked <laughs> simply and we called them wicked last time the wicked the lost those that are under judgment does that make sense does that help a little bit so <clears throat> Man was, as we recall, man was created on the sixth day and Jesus died on the sixth day to set, became fallen mankind in order on the sixth day in order to save fallen mankind, all of them. There's no partial redemption at the cross that only those that are saved or predestined are saved at the cross. No, in one man, all died. In one man, all are made alive. So, <clears throat> We just have to choose it or not. Isn't that interesting? There's no excuse that anybody should perish because all we have to do is believe in our Lord Jesus Christ that he is our savior, our righteousness. He's sufficient for all. Okay. <clears throat> the catch is not only believing, but uh, allowing him to be Lord in your life. He has to be Lord. If you truly believe that, you confess, but you, when you truly believe it deep down inside in your mm. heart, you will follow God. It just happens. That's who we want to be like. If you really love Jesus, you want to be like him. He's, <laughs> I really do, I'll tell you. And, you know, it doesn't, not in order to be saved, but because I am saved, <laughs> you know. But you don't, if you start being a servant of other things, I want to mention one other thing. All the wicked have that mark on them. And this is from the, from the very beginning, get go. Let me just show you somebody. Genesis 4, 7. I think that was your text, wasn't it, Patty? Yes. This is Cain. He's talking to Cain here. God's talking to Cain. This is not the mark on Cain, but it's very interesting. When he talked to Cain, he had already had an issue over worship, remember? And he didn't like his brother Abel, he was angry at him. And God comes to warn him. He warned him. Isn't that interesting? God always warns. He comes to warn Cain. And here's the warning he gave Cain in Genesis 4, 7. If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you but you must rule over it. So there you go. Sin, he, and then what did Cain allow to do? He allowed sin. He became a servitude. He was the mark of servitude to sin. That's what the mark of the beast is. He, in, instead of him ruling over sin, we talked about this in that study on authority. He served sin, you might say. He became a servant to sin. And he allowed sin to dominate his life. He had the mark of the beast. 
he was a servitude towards sin. And if you're a servitude towards sin, you're a servitor towards sin. a servant of sin. You're a servant to the dragon. This is how it is. You only have two. You can't serve two masters. You either serve God or you serve this worldly system. There's, there's no in between. There's no gray in God. There's black and white. So back to the 144,000. Let me kind of clear up anything. Any questions about the mark of the beast? It was, we kind of all moving on from there. So back to the 144,000, <clears> to all Israel, all the redeemed, they have the Lamb's name and his Father's name. <clears throat> Interesting. What's the number of the Lamb's name? Well, his name is Jesus. You know, what's his name? Jesus. Lamb is a symbol in Revelation. His name is Jesus. He will be called Jesus. You're to call him Jesus. The angel told both Mary and Joseph, call your son Jesus. So they couldn't miss it. They knew what they were supposed to call Jesus, who they what they were supposed to call Jesus when he was born. Both Joseph and Mary were told by the angel to call him Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. And that's basically means savior. But if you do a sophosy, a sophosy, however you pronounce that, and you take a sum of Jesus in the Greek, add up all those numerical values, you know what the sum is? Do you remember? It's a long time ago we had that lesson. Eight 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 yeah eight eight eight. It adds up to eight eight eight. What does eight mean? <laughs> New beginning. New beginning. Yeah. And you got it to the third. You know, <laughs> at that. So it's interesting. Six six six. You have, you have the, you have three sixes, which should have life, but the only life you have is earthly life that fallen mankind has. You have Jesus, and you have His name. You have eight eight eight. You have the new eternal you're in the new mankind <laughs> jesus created himself one new mankind and you have his name stamped on you on your forehead written written on your forehead you're in a new family <laughs> that's why you have his father's name our father in heaven he's our new father <laughs> we have a new family that makes us all brothers and sisters isn't that just amazing mm -hmm. so claimed by the god of the universe so 888 and just as an aside because I like to do that, you know, and this is out of that book that I talked about way back when quantum glory. So I'll give credit to, to Phil Mason, but Christ, Jesus sums up to 888 and Christ sums up to 1,480. Okay. So you add those two together and it's 2368. And so if you compare 888 to 1480 to 2368, it's a golden proportion of three five eight does that sound familiar like fibonacci numbers like the ratios three five to eight those ratios of the both arcs of many of the the bronze altar all these things have in the golden altar of incense always have those proportions those golden proportions it was three to three to five to eight if you take those three numbers is i've lost everybody <laughs> 888 compared to 1480 so we're talking about jesus christ okay because he's often called jesus christ christ is not a name it says jesus the messiah it means messiah christ does the anointed one so if you add them together you have that proportion 358 and right in the middle is the golden mean which is five which is christ the anointed one <laughs> If I lost everyone. Anyway, that's just an aside. So I remember all that. So Jesus Christ is the perfect golden ratio, the logos, the word of God. And to a Greek that encompasses everything because if you had the, if you could think, if you could get the word, the word means you have the power to, you could create, you can do things with words. So in Greek, my word was a powerful name of Jesus and he's called the word. Okay. So, so we have that new name in our, for, our foreheads. We are God's children in his family. We have his name. It's interesting, Revelation 2.12, the sixth promise to the overcomer. It's in the, uh, to the Philadelphia church. We have the, the overcomer has the name of my God, the city of, Jesus says, the, the name of my God, the, the name of the city of my God, which is the new Jerusalem, and my new name. Jesus says that 
vacuum filled to the Philadelphian, the overcomer in that church, that sixth church. So Deuteronomy 28, 10 said, all the peoples of earth will see you're called by the name of the Lord. Lord being Jehovah in the Old Testament there. So we're called by the name of the Lord. We have his name on us, written on our foreheads, oh, and the seal of that living God, like we talked about earlier. Okay, moving right along. Any questions? So the 144,000 aren't virgin Jews. <laughs> we'll get into we'll get into their characteristics right down here coming up. <laughs> Thank you for saying those things. I had two nice young men at my door one time that told me that 144,000 were the elite of their particular group that would be in heaven someday. Yeah, there you go. <clears throat> Person told me the 144,000 when, when it says all Israel was saved, it was all Israel. I thought, well, that's interesting because one of the tribes is not even mentioned. So, you know, get you a lot know. of interesting ideas. Up there. <laughs> I mean, if it's only if all Israel is 144,000, we got a real problem because there's a lot more than that that are saved. <laughs> you know, so out of Israel, as a matter of fact, <laughs> literal Israel, <laughs> and we're all Israel though. So, okay. So, Revelation, the new song of the redeemed, Revelation 14, 2 to 3. And I have you could be out of something in Revelation 5 in just a minute. Okay. I'm ready. Go ahead. Okay. And I heard a sound from heaven like the roar of rushing waters and like a loud peal of thunder. The sound I heard was like that of a harpist playing their harps. And they sang a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders. Go ahead and read the next uh, sentence there. Oh, I'm sorry. No oh, yeah. one could learn the song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. So it's clearly here, the 144,000 are redeemed from the earth. We got that. That sound from heaven. Notice he looked and there before him was the lamb and he had 144,000 and then he hears. Remember, we talked about this being a common pattern in the book of Revelation. John hears something and he, he looks and now he hears a sound from heaven. He's hearing the sound of the 144,000 standing up there with the Zion on Mount Zion. And it's interesting. And it was a sound like the roar of rushing waters. <laughs> you see, when Revelation 115 said that Jesus had a voice like the roar of rushing waters. And then in John 7, when we're born again, we have living water flowing out. So you have a vast multitude <laughs> without number, which the 144,000 is a symbol of. We talked about that before. He heard the number and he looked and it was a vast multitude. That would sound like pretty much a roar of rushing waters, would it not? Hmm. Like a loud peal of thunder. And that was six one, which was the voice of a loud voice of uh, the, um, the lamb opened the first seals and I heard one of the four living creatures saying a voice like thunder come and out rides the white horse, <laughs> the conqueror to riding to conquer the whole earth. Mm -hmm. Jesus Christ on the white horse. The first seal ripped off the inheritance. Oh, I just love it. There's so many tie-ins to other things in Revelation. And it's the sound of harpists playing their harps. We will see these harpists again in Revelation 15. They're going to be singing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb in the next study on chapter 15. But here, they're singing the new song. Did you know there are two different songs? Did you ever know that? Well, it tells, you, it tells us what the new song is right in the book of Revelation. But it's, we've already talked about it. It's in Revelation 5. The harpists are playing... And no one, it was when the harpists are playing their harps. The context here, Revelation 5, 5 to 8, is because the, the, the scroll of the inheritance was unable to be opened. No one in heaven or earth or under the earth could open up the inheritance so we could become sons and daughters of God. No one, <laughs> no one. And John's weeping and weeping. And so what do we see here? Revelation 5, 5 to 8, Janice. And one of the elders said to me, weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And between the throne and the four living creature, creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain, 
with seven horns and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Okay, stop right there. Who's holding the harps? The four um, living creatures and the 24 elders. And what would the 24 elders represent? You remember the governance? The elders always govern the, the entire body of the redeemed. <laughs> they're, they're the governors, you might say the leaders. We see that again and again, the elders being leaders. In other words, it's corporate redeemed. What do the four living creatures represent? You remember, I'm, I'm no, this year, I have to think back a few weeks, <laughs> or a couple months maybe, <laughs> Revelation 5. The four living creatures represented those in, in the new mankind. We talked about how each of the four living creatures, rep, living creatures represent that living new man and the attributes of Jesus. We are born, we are created in him, in his likeness. Isn't that interesting? So this is in a sense the redeemed, <laughs> but corporately and symbolically of the redeemed. They're holding the four, uh, the, these harps. And we see in Revelation 14, 15, that the harps are given them by God. <laughs> so God gives us the harps. <laughs> he gives us the song. Okay, Revelation, let's see what they sang. This is the new song, Revelation 5, 9 and 10, Tim. And they sang a new song with these words. You are worthy to take the scroll and break its seals and open it. For you were slaughtered and your blood was rans has ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have caused them to become a kingdom of priests for our God. And they will reign on the earth. There you go. How, how come is he worthy? They're singing the song of what? The lamb being worthy to take the scroll and open the seals. Mm. He alone is worthy. Why? Because he was slain mm -hmm. and with his blood, he purchased men for God from every tribe, every language, every people, every nation. It, it doesn't matter. It's not talking about one nation above another. All nations, all peoples, all languages, all tribes or families. Mm -hmm. All of them. He purchased us out of there. He made us that kingdom that heavenly kingdom of priests. Now that you see them standing on Mount Zion, singing the new song. Why could only the redeemed, the 144,000, learn the new song? Who <laughs> tells you? Who are these in white robes in Revelation 7? <laughs> Who the are redeemed. these? The redeemed. At, they, because they washed their robes and made them white. white. In what? Blood. The blood. The blood. Jesus. The lamb. That's how come they alone could sing this new song. It's a song, like you say, of land of the redeemed. And the only, the only thing that, the re only reason why they could learn it is because they had washed their robes in the blood of the lamb. So they're wearing the white robe of Christ's righteousness because they see the substitutionary death of Christ for themselves. He died for me personally. I take it personal. When you take communion, take it personal. Don't put it out there for everybody else. Put it for, take it personal. Because it's an individual thing. No matter whether a sister, brother, parent, husband, wife, sibling, children, grandkids, friends, neighbors, no matter what they think or accept, it's still an individual choice. We personally must make. Anyway, they're, they're singing the new song. Okay, I think we need to re sign some more verses here. Okay, Lynn, Revelation 14, 4, and Patty, Revelation 6, 5 to 6. And Gail, can I go have you just scooch back to Jeremiah 2, 3? <laughs> Keep your finger in 14, we're coming right back. <laughs> but Jeremiah 2, 3, and uh, uh, let's see, Janice, Revelation 14, 5. 
And then Tim, you'll be Revelation 14, six to seven. Okay. Okay. Okay, so the description of the redeemed. We're gonna break this down, this whole description of the redeemed. Revelation 14, four. <laughs> These are those who did not defile themselves with women, for they kept themselves pure. They follow the lamb wherever he goes. They were purchased from among men and offered as first fruits to God and the lamb. Okay, let's break it down. They did not defile themselves with women. What's the significance of that? They were pure. They were pure. We see that Babylon is an adulterous woman. <laughs> and to be one with her is to be one in impurity. Babylon is a sign of, you know, the ungodly, the wicked kingdom. Uh, Revelation uh, 9, 8 had said something about that. Revelation 9, 8. Um, uh, it, when it talks about the locusts, remember the locusts of the fifth, trumpet that come out they look like horses but they look like locusts and they kind of morph into horses horses in the next one their hair was like women's hair and their teeth were like lion's teeth in other words women's hair seductive the kingdom of the world represented by those locusts that are devouring and eating up the world have like women's hair seductive um they kept themselves pure. That's 2 Corinthians 11, 2 to 3. We don't have time to read all these texts, but it talks about us being a pure bride. Devoted to Jesus. Devoted only. to Jesus alone. That's right. That was 2 Corinthians 11, 2 to 3. And they follow the lamb wherever he goes. In John 10, it says, I, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. And the redeemed are his sheep. Follow the voice of a stranger. He won't follow the voice of a stranger. Any other comments? Some of you have been looking the text up. These were in the study notes that it sent out. Um, we, we only follow the lamb. There's an obedience that happens when we follow what the lamb tells us to do. We won't listen to another. To the, th the, the, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. We're not going to listen to the thief. We listen to the good shepherd. We follow him. Purchased from among men. We just talked about that, didn't we? <laughs> Purchased from every nation by his blood. So this is the redeemed. It's all the redeemed. You can see these are the characteristics of all the redeemed people. Is there any exception or any that redeemed not this? So if it's every person that's redeemed fits this description. So they're offered as first fruits to God and the lamb. I just love the first fruit screen. I couldn't help but go back. Went to the third seal being opened in Revelation 6, 5 and 6. <laughs> Patty, could you read that for us? Um, maybe I'm in the wrong spot. Revelation 6, verses 5 and 6. This is the lamb opening the third seal. Yeah, I went to the wrong spot. Sorry. It's okay. <clears throat> when the lamb opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, come. I looked and there before me was a black horse. Its rider was holding a pair of scales in his hand. Then I heard what sounded like a voice among the four living creatures saying, two pounds of wheat for a day's wages and six pounds of barley for a day's wages, and do not damage the oil and the wine. Okay. <clears throat> this is a the context of this is judgment because it's a black horse <laughs> holding the scales, the writer, the judge, and judgment. I want to mention, because we're going to get into judgment in just a minute. This, this is in context of judgment, and we're going to be in judgment just in a short, just in a couple of short verses away. Love true love and god alone is love when you have love you will have justice and that involves judgment if you don't judge and get rid of the killer you don't love the flip side of love is justice and judgment thank 
God, he kills the killer. <laughs> he deals with the murderer. You know why he hates him so much? Because sin and everything in that camp hurts people. Everything that you can label as sin, S-I-N, hurts somebody else, yourself or somebody. God doesn't believe in hurting each other. He doesn't believe in murdering and hurting and all those things that hurt another. Because he is pure love. So he's going to deal with the murderer and everybody that chooses to be in that camp, that are in that camp. Notice here. That voice came from among the four, here's a voice among the four living creatures saying a quart of wheat, excuse me, I have to come back to a measure of wheat because if we get into pounds and kilograms and who knows what, we're missing the point of what's talked about here. Remember we talked about with symbols and numbers. So we're gonna go back to the Greek, it's one measure, <laughs> one measure of wheat for a day's wages and three measures of barley for a day's wages. And do not damage the oil and the wine. The oil and this all had to do with the offering of the first fruits. And the oil and the wine, by the way, were the anointing and the blood. It's basically those things that were always with the sacrificial offering every day of the week. In the Old Testament, they had the oil and the wine. They also had the oil, measures of oil and wine with every single, it's always a quarter hint of wine because it represents Jesus, the quarter hint of wine. His pouring out his death on the cross for the earth, one quarter, one fourth, okay? It's very significant, always. But the, there's a little difference on the oil. It's sometimes an ifa of oil, sometimes it's two ifas of oil. But the interesting thing when we studied this, remember it talked about first fruits. It ties directly to first fruits. Now, first fruits comes right out of the Passover and Feast of Unleavened Bread, seven weeks, seven days in that feast. The day after the Sabbath, which happened to be the first day of the week when Jesus was actually crucified, was the waving of the sheep of the first harvest. That's a barley sheep. No one could eat any of the new harvest until the barley sheep had been waved, representing Jesus, that mighty sheep being waved in the presence of the priest. And now they could actually enter in and eat and partake of the harvest. And 50 days later was the final harvest. Remember Boaz and Ruth, we talked about it all. Ruth comes back at the barley, the beginning of the barley harvest, and she stays working in Boaz's field until the 50 days. And now you got the wheat harvest in. Barley harvest is in, you got the wheat harvest in. This is all talking about first fruits here. Don't damage this. Keep the oil and wine. Keep the first fruits. Keep the harvest. This is what it's talking about here. Three quarts, three measures of barley. We're called the first fruits. Guess when they actually brought the first fruits offering, though? Three being the number of life. There's one measure of wheat. That's Jesus. <laughs> it's one harvest. You see? but there's three measures of barley. Do you know when they bought, bought their first fruits? On the second feast, which is one day, a one day feast. And it was the feast of harvest. It's also called Pentecost. It was 50 days on the day after the Sabbath from the waving of the first sheaf of the harvest, of bar, the first harvest, till you bring everybody brought to Jerusalem their offering of first fruits on Pentecost day. The one day feast. Does that kind of remind you of one day? We'll all have be involved in what? The main feast, the marriage supper of the lamb. The whole harvest sitting down with the, the lamb. Oh, I'm getting carried away. I'm so sorry. But this is, no, I'm not sorry. I knew I better correct myself. <laughs> so offered his first fruits to God and to the lamb. That's the hunt. That's so, don't you see? We're offered for, as first fruits. Jesus is called the first fruits too, but I won't get into all that. In Jeremiah 2 3, it's kind of an interesting passage back there. Uh, Gail, I had you turn into that one. It was in the context of this, is, is that uh, it talked about Israel forsaking God, but it's talking about what they were when they were not forsaking God here in this 
verses, it's entering into their become apostate. But when they were still God's people, this is what they look like. And it's talking about you were this. Okay, Jeremiah 2, 3. Oh, could you turn on unmute, please, Gail? <laughs> Um, Israel was holy to the Lord. The first fruits of his harvest, all who devoured her were held guilty and disaster overtook them, declares the Lord. So Israel was called what? The first fruits. First fruits. And 144,000 are all Israel being saved, all the tribes of Israel. Isn't that interesting? When you're loyal and holy to God, you're the first fruits. You're offered as first fruits. Revelation 14, verse 5. And in their mouth, and in their mouth, no lie was found, for they are blameless. There you go. No lie was found in their mouths. Wow, that's a heavy one. Why do you think there's no lie found in their mouths? Okay, you know this one. It's pretty obvious. Because <laughs> that they're blameless. Blameless. And who is the murderer and the liar from the very beginning? <laughs> Satan. Satan. He's a liar. When he speaks a lie, he speaks his language because he was his native language because he was a liar at the, in the very beginning. And it says Jesus had no deceit in his mouth. And Zephaniah 3.11, talking about the righteous, there's no deceit in their mouths. We're absolutely 100% on God's side we are on the side of the truth and what is the truth it's found in a person jesus the, the truth and the life jesus christ himself 100 percent on the side of jesus isn't this good this is a description of the 144,000 the redeemed from the earth we already talked about how the redeemed are blameless. <clears throat> so we're going to move right into the three important proclamations to the earth. <laughs> he says, then I saw another angel flying in midair. I want to talk about this first. And I'll let you read it in just a second, Tim. Another angel flying in midair. So, you know, there's been other angels mentioned. I was trying to figure out where he was referring to another beast. Because there hadn't been any angels mentioned so far in this chapter, but it must be referring somewhere back to um, the seventh angel pointing out his trumpet, because that's the most recent angel I saw in the book. <laughs> so it's kind of harking back perhaps to the seventh trumpet there. I've seen another angel, because remember there was a seventh angel sounded his trumpet, and it was the coming of the Lord. And now we see another angel. So this is just another, remember we talked about Revelation, it has these layers, it kind of has these uh, things running along itself and describing more and more, we're getting, we've heard, oh yeah, this sounds familiar, Bev, I've kind of heard about the coming of the Lord before, now I'm going to hear more, some, some more details, I'm going to get some more things filled in on it. This is how Revelation is, it's layers, it's kind of, as it goes along, this is the way the book is built. Does this make sense? So now we're going to see the coming of the Lord. Uh, but there's an eagle flying in there and why and the second and the third follow that first one they're all flying in midair these first three angels are flying in midair why midair <clears throat> well what happens in midair it's not good by the way <laughs> it's kind of that air right here under heaven it's kind of for this earthly air, he might say <laughs> the air that the birds fly around in down here <laughs> it's here. And uh, we, saw, we saw in Revelation 8.13, an eagle was flying in midair, and he announced, whoa, 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 to the inhabitants of the earth, for there's three woes are coming, and it was the fifth trumpet, the sixth trumpet, and the seventh trumpet coming. That was the eagle flying there. And then we'll see in Revelation 19.17, an angel standing in the sun, crying in a loud voice to the birds flying in midair. <laughs> And he called them to the great supper of God. What's the great supper of God? They're feeding on the carcasses of the wicked. Mm -hmm. It's the final judgment against the wicked. 
So when we see announcements in midair, it's a calling to the wicked and a warning to them to get out of there, to move into God's camp so they can be part of the 144,000. Okay, Tim, would you read Revelation 14, 6 to 7? Also have some universal aspect flying through the air, kind of covering the earth. Yeah, going clear around the earth. That's a good idea. That's and a good the thought. The voice would seem like urgency to me. Yes, calling in a loud voice. <laughs> when it's a loud voice, you better listen up. Listen up. This is very important to hear it. Go for it, Tim. I saw another angel flying through the sky, hearing the eternal good news to proclaim to the people who belong to this world, to every nation, tribe, language, and people. Fear God, he shouted. Give glory to him, for the time has come when he will sit as judge. Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and all the springs of water. There you go. He said in a loud voice. Whew. He has the everlasting gospel. What is it a call? What is this a call? Is this the final call to worship God, would you say? Is this a call? It's about worship. I've said that the whole book of the Bible has to do with who are you going to worship? You can only worship one or the other. There's no sitting on the fence. We're going to worship God or we're going to worship everything down here. Man, what mankind produces, the stuff of, down here, which ultimately is a dragon. So the call to worship. Worship is the central dividing point. Think about several places where worship was a dividing point in the Old Testament. First one in, in Genesis 3, the obvious first one. Cain and Abel. Cain versus Abel. You remember that? There was Ishmael and Isaac. Ishmael, Abraham, Abraham's first son. And Isaac, when, they, when Isaac was weaned, he mocked the promised son. You see, he was, that was something about worship, wasn't it? Because not that Isaac was to be worshipped, but he symbolized the son to come, Jesus Christ. Got sent away for it. Think about Pharaoh and the Israelites. And they were asking to go out in the desert to worship their gods. And Pharaoh says, no, I'm not going to let you go worship. The issue with Israel, Pharaoh and the Israelites was over worship. The three Hebrews, the issue is over worship all the way to scripture who are we who who are we going to worship are we worshiping god or worshiping our own pride our own self you know the things of this earth apostate israel versus the true israelites indeed whom there's no guile like nathaniel under the fig tree apostate israel it, the issue was always over worship in the Old Testament, Israel. Baal, you know, <laughs> Elijah on Mount Carmel. <clears throat> and why is he calling a loud voice and calling them to worship God? Why? The hour of judgment has come. When was the first hour of judgment that came on the earth? I mean, really, when we think hour of judgment in the New, the New Testament in Jesus. I'm going to give you a clue I'm, where I'm going with this. Jesus is now is the hour of the judgment of the world at the cross when he went to the cross because why because the whole world was judged in one person one man Jesus Christ the wrath of God fell on Jesus Christ who knew no sin when he became sin the wrath of God for all fallen humanity fell upon him, Jesus Christ, in that hour of judgment. When will the final hour of judgment take place? The last day. The coming, that last day, the coming. The cross to the coming. These are the two things that are the cross, the coming, the culmination. They so, point to each other. Just really, it's those two things, really. Are you in? Are you already judged, or are you going to be judged? <laughs> it's as simple as that. I mean, it's profound, and it's not. I don't make it. I'm not making it simple by making it simple, but I'm just saying it's not that. 
It's understandable. Do you understand? I didn't mean simple in the terms of simple could sometimes sound simple. It's not simplistic, it's profound, <laughs> but it's understandable. Okay, Revelation 14, 8, we'll have that for Lynn. And Revelation 14, 9 to 11, B, Patty. So the sentence has been handed out, but it's not yet carried, I mean, not so brought to full completion. Right. The sentence has been, salvation has been accomplished. Mm -hmm. the, the judgment has been met in Christ. But if they're not in Christ, it has not been met because it will be dealt with in the end. Sin will be dealt with. So Patty is that one. And so, oh, I'm going to send you back the Old Testament again, Gail. I uh, say a 34, 1 to 2, and 8 to 12. <laughs> you mind going back to the Old Testament for us? It's Isaiah 34, 1 and 2, and then 8 through 12. And then Janice, Revelation 14, 12. And Tim, Tim, I'm going to have you read John 15, 14, 15. And we'll start over again, assigning a little bit. Okay, are we ready for the second angel's announcement of Babylon's doom? Okay, Lynn. A second angel followed and said, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the Great, which made all the nations drink the madness, maddening wine of her adulteries. So it's interesting that fallen, fallen is Babylon. This is an announcement. It's just this fact. Babylon is fallen. Now, this is the first time Babylon is mentioned by name as a symbol in the book of Revelation is here. We talked about it in the last one. We talked about Revelation 13, the beast out of the sea is Babylon, but it's not mentioned until here. And we're gonna, it's, gonna, it's leading into what we're going to be seeing coming up in the next few chapters. There's going to be a lot of discussion about Babylon and its demise, its total destruction, okay? There's gonna be some details filled in about Babylon. Do you remember when Babylon was first mentioned in the Bible? Anybody can think about that first time? Well, I went and looked it up. Uh-huh, when is it? Well, it's referred to in Genesis, but it's actually the word is mentioned in 2 Kings when, um, when Israel and Judah were separated. And basically from what I gathered when I was reading it, it was really about, it was divisive it was about division that was my take on it really? that it was trying to divide um because they even got judah to uh worship and be pagan interesting so that was the dividing the yeah there was that's how i saw it as 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 that it was um it was the second kings did i write it down I well, it does to the tower in the very beginning, but yeah, it, Second Kings seventeen twenty four is where that I found. The first time when it talks about, sec, I know it goes back to Genesis ten, Babylon is actually right, but they don't use the word that was referred to, right? They don't actually say Babylon, do they? They talk about Nimrod and it does say Babylon in my. Is that, oh, okay. Where in Genesis is that? But I find it very interesting what you're bringing up, Lynn, because it had the, the second time it's mentioned then would be Second Kings, where Israel and Judah were divided. Yeah. Because they yeah. would be tied in directly to God's people and a dividing in God's people. Right. I had never thought about that dimension on this. This is very interesting to me. So, um, so it was first mentioned... Well, you remember Ham was the third son of Noah. You remember that he was, he did a dastardly deed with his father, Noah, after the flood, uh, a sexual, uh, a sexual deed. It was not good. Um, anyway, um, and he had a son, his firstborn of Ham was Cush. And Cush's main son we hear mentioned in here is Nimrod. Nimrod built the first big city, Babylon, and three other cities on the plain of Shinar. He built Babylon, and that's the first time we see it. Nimrod was a mighty hunter against the Lord. So 
some people say before the Lord, but a lot of people feel like it is against the Lord. He built the city, just like Cain was the first one to build the city in the Old Testament. The wicked people built cities. <laughs> so cities were not God's idea. They weren't God's idea. Except for heaven. Heaven, he has a city. <laughs> this is only temporary down here. You don't settle down here, but the wicked are going to be settling down here. So they want to ornate cities and ornate places to live. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So cities are their protection. They can put walls around cities. It doesn't mean that the Israelites didn't build cities, like rebuild their earthly Jerusalem whenever they inherited the as a nation, the promised land. But Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob never built a city. <laughs> We're Abraham's kids. Okay. But that's interesting. I'd have to look that up some more, Lynn. I'll have to think I'm about trying it. To, I'm going to try to find the verse again. I think I wrote the wrong verse down when I was reading it today, but... I'll see if I can find it again. Because that would be an interesting study to think about Babylon first mentioned there. And then we in the table of nations in Genesis 10. And then suddenly the next time we see it in the Old Testament, it had to do with the division in Israel of the 10 tribes splitting off and becoming the kingdom of Israel and the kingdom of Judea, of Judah in the south and that had Jerusalem in it. Source of division from the beginning. Yes, mm -hmm. very much. And we saw the Tower of Babel on there, too, as we mentioned. And it does refer to the Tower of Babel. That's what this kind of refers to that came out of that. But yeah. I will see if I can. I'll have to go back and find where I saw that. So oh, well, share, share it on the next beginning of the next study, Lynn. It'd be okay. <laughs> hear that. Would you like to? We'll just start it up the next study with that. Just because we talked about it and this went on chapter 14. So it'd be fun to just, just throw it out there. Um, so thank you for bringing that. He met Babylon made how many nations drink the maddening, which is fury, anger, and rage wine. Doesn't sound like a very good wine, does it? Mm. Of her adulteries, no matter, no wonder the 144,000 do not defile themselves with women. Okay. So how many nations? Oh. All that's right, all the nations. There's not an exception. Oh, right. Every single nation gets involved in the kingdom of darkness. Okay, moving right along. Revelation 14, 9 to 11 is that third angel with a loud voice declares the judgment on the wicked. <laughs> okay, Revelation 14, 9 to 11. A third angel followed them and said in a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast and its image and receives its mark on their forehead or on their hand, they too, <coughs> excuse me, will drink the wine of God's fury, which has been poured for full strength into the cup of his wrath. They will be tormented with burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment will rise forever and ever. There will be no rest day or night for those who worship the beast and its image for anyone who receives the mark of its name. Okay. This is a heavy, isn't it? This is describing the final judgment of God against the wicked. It's these the judgment against the wicked who worship the beast and his image or have his mark of his name. There's four elements in this punishment, not an eternal punishing, by the way. And let's break it down and explain it because I want it to be clear. Four elements. They will drink the wine of God's fury. And that's the same word of the maddening wine up there, which is that fury, anger, and rage. They have fury, man, anger, and rage in their what they do down here. But God's is a holy anger because he is so angry at all the pain that sin has caused in this world. His heart is grieved by it. We saw it in Noah's day. The wickedness of man grieves the heart of God because he sees how much it hurts mankind. That's how God's anger is. It's a righteous indignation. They will drink the wine of God's fury poured out full strength in the cup of his wrath. It says the nations will drink in Obadiah 16 in contrast to Mount Zion in Ob Obadiah 16. 
in contrast to Mount Zion in Obadiah 16, the nations, the wicked nations will drink and drink and be as if they never were. Does that sound like destroyed? Going to drink and drink and be as if they never were. Note, mm -hmm. on the cross, Jesus drank the cup. Remember three times he says, if possible, let this cup pass from me. But if not, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Jesus was obedient even to death on the cross, it says in the Bible. He, that cup is the cup of God's wrath. He's asking for that cup to be passed from him. But he knew there was no other way. There was no other way to bring salvation for fallen mankind. Okay? Secondary thing. Tormented with burning sulfur in the King James, it says fire and brimstone. That's in the in our my translation, it says burning sulfur. Yeah. This is always referring to God's judgment. It's pictured in the Old Testament as fire and brimstone or burning sulfur. Where do you think of um, Edom's land becomes burning sulfur? Um, and we'll get down to that in just a minute. And Edom, by the way, is a, is a name for Esau. E Edom means red. And it's like Adam, Adam. Same root, Adam, Eden. You see the fallen mankind again, pictured in Esau, who rejected. What happened with Esau? He despised his inheritance. The whole thing. <laughs> The whole, the whole, the whole scroll was the inheritance, and Esau despised his inheritance. Value our, we must value our inheritance in Christ. Oh, okay. So burning sulfur. We'll get back to Edom a little bit, but that that land becomes burning sulfur. It's desolation. We see it also in Ezekiel thirty-eight, Isaiah three. Uh, burning sulfur is a symbol of extinction, destruction, eradication, extermination, and annihilation. The, I'm taking some of this out of Edward Fudge's The Fire That Consumes. I've talked about that book, his detailed discussion. He has umpteen texts. These are just a few I'm pulling out of there, and I give credit for that in my notes. And I want to give it credit for it here because he is the most studied on everything that alludes to hell in the whole Bible. And the final punishment of the wicked. He also so, called its poison. Um, the sulfur, burning sulfur, creates poison. Interesting. Appreciate anyway, that's in the book as well. Wow. Thank you for bringing that up. And it's interesting because it's always referring to that burning sulfur. Um, notice it's in the presence of God and the holy angels. They're tormented. Remember the, the uh, demons at the Gardenas, the Gardenas uh, demons there saying, are you going to, Gadarenes? Yeah, let's pronounce Gadarenes. it. Gadarenes. Are you going to torment be us before our time? The time is this, the torment. Torment meant punished. They're, they're punished with fire and brimstone. That's referring to this punishment, not punishing. It goes on forever and ever. I want to make that clear. It's a punishment. That's how God, because he's a God of love, is not punishing you forever. If you were born back in Noah's day, you'd be puni being punished. How many years already? Being punished. How many years? And if you're the last one punished, then you, you start your millennial forever then. That's not God. That's not God. Nowhere in scripture is that really taught. We see that these symbols, they make them become the realities and then they miss the point of what the symbol is talking about. We want to be sure that we don't make the symbol be the reality, but understand what the symbol represents because that's what the book of Revelation is about. In the presence of God and the holy angels, do you notice again and again, there's always God and the holy angels when it comes to the final coming? He comes with his angels. We see again and again the angels. <laughs> You know, 
So um, basically, it's in other words, the punishment will be in the presence of God and the angels because it's going to be at the coming of the Lord. It's not that he's going to have this punishment punishing going on forever and ever when you're up in heaven and there you're with God and the angels and you're seeing this punishment. <laughs> you know, no, I just want to make this very, very clear. Let's not make the symbols be the realities. The symbols represent that this happens at the coming because Jesus, the Holy God, is there and with his angels at his coming. So the forever and ever is a reference to permanence. Yes, permanence. And the smoke, the third thing, the smoke of their torment rises forever and ever. The smoke speaks of an annihilate. And when we think about Sodom, which is a symbol, it's a type. It really happened, okay? Some of these stories, it really did happen. It was destroyed by fire and brimstone. It really did happen, literally. Because it literally will happen in the end for the whole world. But that becomes a symbol in prophetic words, in prophetic language. You understand how symbols get out of some real true stories. True, truly happened. Symbols come. Okay. So smoke speaks of annihilated city and no inhabitants. Remember, Abram, Abraham gets up. He looks down. And Abram sees the smoke rising from the city. Abraham does. He sees it rising from the city. Fire consumes what's left is smoke. If smoke's rising, you can't rebuild it, can you? Some, if a house is on fire, you can't rebuild the house, can you? In other words, iniquity will never rise again, ever. No sin, no pain, no sorrow, no suffering, no death, ever and ever. And we'll see more details of this in the fall of Babylon, Revelation 18. So we're not done with all this kind of discussion. It'll come up again with a few more details in Revelation 18. No rest day or night for the wicked. Because there is no rest outside of Jesus, who is our rest. There's no rest. Okay, Gail. Read Isaiah 34, 1 and 2, and then 8 through 12. This is talking about Edom being judged we talked about Edom just a minute ago come near you nations and listen pay attention you peoples let the earth hear and all that is in it the world and all that comes out of it the Lord is angry with all nations his wrath is upon all their armies he will totally destroy them he will give them over to slaughter um, eight, if not to eight, eight for the for the Lord has a day of vengeance, a year of retribution to uphold Zion's cause. Edom's streams will be turned into pitch, her dust into burning sulfur. Her land will become blazing pitch, and it will not be quenched night and day. Its smoke will rise forever. From generation to generation, it will lie desolate. No one will ever pass through it again. The desert owl and screech owl will possess it. The great owl and the raven will nest there. God will stretch out over Edom, the measuring line of chaos and the plumb line of desolation. Her nobles will have nothing there to be called a kingdom. All of her princes will vanish away. That, what does that sound like to you? Mm -hmm. Eternal forever punishment. Mm -hmm. The kingdom passes away, never to be seen again. Fire is not quenched day or night. The smoke's rising forever. In other words, it's forever done. It's over. Okay. Let's move on to the char three characteristics of the saints. In Revelation 14, 12. Here is the call for the endurance of the saints, those who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. Okay, Tim, John 14, 15. If you love me, obey my commandments. You will obey my commands. 
if you love me, you'll obey my commands. And skip over then to John 15, 12 to 17 and read that for us really quick. About the vine and the branches. Mm. It's tied in the way we just read. Uh, Talking about remaining in the vine. 12 through what? 12 through eight, um, 12 to 17, if you would. Okay. This is my commandment. Love each other in the same way I have loved you. I have no greater love. There is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you slaves because master, a master doesn't confide in his slaves. Now you are my friends since I have told you everything the father told me. You didn't choose me. I chose you. I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit so that the Father will give you whatever you ask for using my name. This is my command. Love each other. Interesting. You know who he's talking to? The 11. This is on the night of Passover. Just Judas has already left. He has his 11 faithful around him. And he says, I'm not calling you servants any longer because they don't know the master's business. You know it. And you're obeying. And the biggest obedience is the command of loving others. And in fact, it's a royal law of scripture. If you go to James, royal law of scripture is love your neighbor. Love God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. Isn't that interesting? This is the thing about God's people. They obey God. They patiently endure. And James 5, 7 to 12 talks about the patient endurance of the saints. They obey God and they remain faithful to Jesus. That's the characteristics of the saints. Now, moving on into the blessing. Let's see. Him, so this would be Lynn and the coming. And this would be, uh, we can put this one, go ahead and give this one to you, uh, Patty. And which one? It's going to be Revelation 14, 14. And Gail, can you read mm -hmm. a little bit? We're getting another long passage here. <laughs> <laughs> Matthew 13, we're going to have you read about the parable of the harvest of the earth. We're moving to the harvest of the earth. This is such an exciting part. 24 to 30, and then the interpretation in 36 to 43. Maybe I'll have you read the the 24 to 30 maybe i'll have janice read 36 to 43 just break it up a little bit the interpretation sure. and then tim i'm going to have you read revelation 14 15 to 16 i'll sec finish this section there and we we'll just have a couple of quick verses and we'll be done with the lesson today okay so i love this okay we're going to move into the third blessing in the book of revelation did you know that that there were two in the beginning, the very beginning of the book. The first two blessings out of the eight blessings in the book of Revelation were in Revelation 1 3. Blessed are you if you read this book, and blessed are you if you take it down into your heart. In other words, you do something about it, keep it there. Remember, we talked about that. Now, this is the third one, and we see it right here a, a blessing for the saints. Oh, I just love it. Is the blessing moving right into the harvest, which is the, the coming of the Lord and God's people to go unto Him? Okay, read it for us there, Lynn, in Revelation 14 13. Then I heard a voice from heaven say, Write, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, they will rest from their labor, for their deeds will follow them. This comes right after talking about no rest day or night for the wicked and, the, and the, the punishment of the wicked. And now you get the blessing for the saints. You get a description of them and now the blessing. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. That's all the saints from all these ages who have died. And we haven't, aren't yet, we aren't totally face to face. This mortal has not put on immortality until a moment at twinkling of an eye, the last trump. Well, now I have a question about that uh -huh. because we've talked about the first and second death. The first death is we die 
to sin, we accept Jesus Christ as our Savior, correct? We are born into sin. And the second one is we don't see the second death. Those no, of us don't. who are redeemed, correct? Am I saying that correctly? Yeah. So when I'm reading this, I'm trying to understand, are they talking about what I see it as the first death is when we are born again. We are, we are born into sin. We reject sin. We are now dead to sin. We are alive in Christ. That's the first death, correct? Second death, we will not see. So when this passage here says, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on, is that not referring to those who have come to the cross and are dead to their sin and are now alive in Christ? Because now they rest from their labor and their deeds follow them or are not? You understand what I'm asking? I know what you're asking. You tell me. What do you all think? Let's throw the verdicts out there. <laughs> That's what I think it is. That's my opinion. <laughs> I like that. That's very interesting. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. From now on. From now, From on. now on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But yeah. certainly those that died in the Lord before this were blessed too. Because they already died the first death when they accepted him as their savior. Correct? Well, I don't know. I don't, I, I don't, I, I'm, Bev doesn't always have an answer. So, hey, <laughs> I'm throwing Well, because we talked about the first death, second death. We don't see the second death. It doesn't really talk about the first death as a first death anywhere in scripture. No, but we know we don't have the second one. So, you know, there has to be a first one at some point. And I always thought that that was, you would be dead in your sin and you would be now alive in Christ and you are born again and now you're alive. So I thought that when we physically died, I didn't really think that was considered as an earthly death, but we don't die a second death, no matter what. I'm just I, can gonna... both, I can see what you're saying, Lynn, and I can see it the other way of being those that die in the Lord that, you know, <laughs> you're a saint blessed uh, it says precious of the death of those precious to the lord of the death of the righteous doesn't it say and that that was referring to the physical death back there in the old testament it was okay all right i was so just wondering be a place that the death can refer to physical death because we physically do die and it can be a spiritual death that like we talked about before if you die to yourself <laughs> and a lot made a lot with christ and so I'm not, you know, I haven't really read a commentary on it. So <laughs> well, and the reason I asked is because, either. <laughs> the reason I asked too is because the section then section said, yes, says the spirit, they will rest from their labor for yes. their deeds will follow them. So their labor though, but our labor is we are resting in Jesus. Enter in. We enter into that rest. So I'm just putting it out there. Okay. Make every effort to enter in, make every effort to enter into the rest of Christ. I mean, you know, uh, they rest from their labor. Um, yep. And we don't, and we don't, we do rest from our labor. I can see how that could be a spiritual death that we don't, rest, you know, we died to ourselves as we rest from our labor. Because this is signs and symbols. And that's why I was wondering. <laughs> some is signs and symbols and some in Revelation is not, you know, um, there is some prose periodically in the book of Revelation, but uh, what are your thoughts? Anyone else have a thought on it? Well, you, if you go back to Revelation 9, and, and it says it's talking about worshiping the beast and receiving the mark on the forehead and on the hand. <laughs> you, you know, if it didn't say from now on, I probably would have put some symbolism on it but I keep thinking it's tying it to that event and you know in my former life I believed <laughs> that Christians would be tortured and, and killed during that time when people were receiving the mark of the beast now I'm not quite sure what I believe but it sure looks like a reference to that event that something's happening 
and there are Christians who are going to die and rest during that time. Yeah, no more suffering. No more suffering. I don't know. I always tied it to verse nine. Verse so, nine of uh, oh, here in the in the chapter, third angel followed them. If anyone worships the beast image and receives his mark on his forehead or in hand, he too will drink the. He will be tormented with burning sulfur in the presence of the angels and of the Lamb. Let's see. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, it's it's it seems to be tied up earlier in the chapter because it's referring to that. Um, from now on, I mean, you know, what I do get out of this for their deeds will follow them. I can I can say this much. <laughs> I do think I understand that part. I don't. Maybe the rest. I. They're still saying, I might, I might be sleeping on the Lord might just give my understanding and it, it might confirm it in my own heart what it is. And it needs to be confirmed in your own heart. And it does make it, you've put some interesting light on it, Lynn. And I'm just, and you too, also Patty. And so it's just interesting to me. But for their deeds will follow them. I feel like this has to do with their deeds will last forever. Yeah, your legacy. Yeah. Your legacy. It's your, it's your friends, your family in the kingdom. Those you've influenced forever are going to be with you in the kingdom. Those things on this earth that you've done have eternal value because you've built them into the king. You've, you've taken them along by the hand and then come on with you to the Lord. I mean, this, is the, this should be the heartbeat of all of us. I says, Lord Jesus, is there anybody I've ever led to? to you give me people who are hungry that i can lead to you jesus i pray that prayer a lot of times jesus send the hungry i want to bring more people to your kingdom because that's the deeds that last forever it's not my righteous acts no it's jesus righteous acts it's all about him his righteousness but boy isn't this an encouraging thought okay we're gonna to have to move along um can you give me about another 15 minutes i know that some of you may have to go if you have to go for We'll see you. Well, I catch, I'll catch you up later if you have to go. But we have. And 13 is also in light of 12, talking about persecution, being yes. patient, patient endurance. Through that persecution. is true. It's chapter, verse 12. This so is patient endurance on the part of the saints. So this is literal. I think it is a literal thing. Okay. It seems to be. Thank you for bringing that up because we. Figuring out a text always has to be the context. Why did I think of that, Tim? Thank you for sharing that. <laughs> Patty, let's get it in the context. And here we have to faithfully endure. It's not, you know, this evil persecution that we're going to be going through. And some of the world, a lot of the church right now is already going through. They have to patiently endure, don't they? Mm -hmm. Yeah, just like, just like in John's day. Yeah. yeah. Notice that the deeds don't save them. <laughs> no, it's, all them. it's so important <laughs> thank you for bringing it up patient endurance on the part of the saints yeah. who are there. they're obeying god's commandments they're sticking to god they're not obeying with the the control of the nation say do this or you'll die worship this image of this beast or you're gonna die or we're gonna take away your house we're gonna take away your food we're gonna starve you put it in concentration camp whatever yeah, in light of verse 12, that makes a lot of sense. I think this is prose. <laughs> Thank you. Because I was reading that before today, and I'm thinking, oh, I can go both ways with that. <laughs> but I guess not. You know what I really like is the discussion we get in this group. And I thank you all for participating and for for entering into this discussion because it makes it so very rich. And I enjoy it very much that you guys speak up. And that's wonderful. I don't want to be doing all the talking. So can you give me about 15 more minutes and we could wind the whole chapter down? I know this is going to go an hour and 45 minutes or so. That's because I had a question. No. Well, that's what you do. Ask the questions, Lynn, whatever you are, ask, Gail, ask your questions. It's okay. We are asking them questions. Because somebody else is going to have the question that's watching this. And this way, it really comes out clear to everybody listening down the road. Except for all of you that are going to watch it, this recording someday, you know, down the road. Okay, let's move along then to the um, the coming. Oh my my! 
Revelation 14, 14. <laughs> I always like to call this whole chapter seven from heaven. <laughs> there's, there's three angels, <laughs> but a couple of them, are, three of them are flying midair. Then you have the sun right in the middle, <laughs> the center of it all. <laughs> and then we're getting to that verse right now. And then you're going to get three more angels. <laughs> so there's seven that are heavenly beings here. Okay, 14, 14, the coming. I looked and there before me was a white cloud and seated on the cloud was one like the son of man with a crown of gold on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. So here we see one. He had heard the voice from heaven declaring the blessing. Now he looks. The blessing was for the saints. Now we see. The son, the son of man. I look, a white cloud. White represents what? Righteousness, purity. holiness, purity. And seated on the cloud. Why is he seated on the cloud? <laughs> he sat down on the throne the in heaven. He is seated. This is definitely authority. Yes, he's seated on the cloud. One like a son of man. Doesn't call him the son of man here. Why? Why does it say call Jesus like a son of man? Because now he's glorified. That's what I say. Now he's king in heaven. That's yes. so that's what I was thinking. And he's also the firstborn of many brothers. So if you see it symbolically, you can see it also. It's I think it's both a combination of both. Uh, he's like a son of man. We're we're like he's not ashamed to call you and I his brothers. <laughs> Can you believe this? We're all in the same family. A crown of gold, that's a gold of victory, of course, on his head, and a sharp sickle in his hand. What's he gonna do with the sharp sickle? Reap her reap, reap harvest. The harvest. <laughs> oh, okay. And but before we get in that reaping, can we go ahead back to Matthew 13? I'd really like to do the wheat and the tares. And Tim, can you read the second, the interpretation, uh, uh, 36 to 43 in Matthew 13? We'll break that up for Gail. So Gail's going to read 24. We're in Matthew 13. I just really like to throw this parallel in, this parallel. Matthew 13 is a clear description of the coming of the Lord. It's the only place it talks about that parable. But it is so significant because it so ties together what we're going to read here in Revelation. So I love this parallelism. And then we'll have um, the next one in line will be Lynn again in Revelation 14, 15, and 16. Okay, that's the section of the harvest. And we'll move on to the rest of it then. Okay, Matthew 13, if you want to turn back there for a second. Uh, Gail, can you read 24 to 30? <clears throat> Jesus told them an, another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in the field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. The servants asked him, do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered, because while you are pulling the weeds, you may root up the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned. Then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. Okay. Do you like what, well, you're, you're getting something there, Lynn. I saw the light coming to your eyes here. Well, because some believe in a secret rapture. Mm -hmm. And right here, it's saying what has to be removed first are the weeds. Yes. And it says, let both what? Grow together. together. The harvest. Let them grow together until the harvest. Because mm -hmm. you, if you weed out the weeds first, you're going to have some of the because, well, because they say one's taken and one's left behind. Yeah, yeah. When that's taken is the weed. Yeah, yeah. First. Just bundled together. I just went like, whoa, it just hit me. In the, yeah. There you go. Let's go to the interpretation of this 
terrible because Jesus, they're wondering about this. Verses 36 to 43. I think this is a real important passage on the coming of the Lord because Jesus spells out the meaning of what he tells here and he can't miss it. He didn't want anyone to get messed up on this about his coming. <laughs> it's right here. Okay. Then leaving the crowds outside, Jesus went into the house. His disciples said, please explain to us the story of the weeds in the field. <laughs> they're, that's the one they're Jesus after. replied, the son of man is the farmer who plants the good seed. The field is the world and the good seed represents the people of the kingdom. The sons of the kingdom here, these newer translations. Don't translate sons of sons. In the Greek, it's sons. Okay. <laughs> the sons of the kingdom. Okay. <laughs> well, my translation includes daughters. See. Well, no, but it's sons. That's important. <laughs> the weeds are the people who belong to the evil one. Sons of the evil one. The enemy who planted the weeds among the wheat is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world, and the harvesters are the angels. In case you missed it, the harvest is when? The end of the age. The end of the age, the end of the world, the end of time. So just in case you're wondering when the harvest takes place, that's when the harvest takes place. Jesus explained it here. Okay. Just as the weeds are sorted out and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the world. The Son of Man will send his angels and they will remove from the, his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. And the angels will throw them into the fiery furnace, where there will be weeping and grinding of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in their father's kingdom. Anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. He who has ears, let him hear. We just remember we just had he who has ears, let him hear in chapter 13, when it talked about the beast out of the sea. God said, he that has ears, let him hear. Jesus says this right here. He who has ears, let him hear. Help him understand. This, this is it. When he says that after an explanation of a parable, you better understand what he's talking about here. It's a real important parable, this is. Explaining it. Notice the wicked are bundled up. Who's the evil one? Who's the enemy? It's the devil. It makes it really clear. It's the sons of the evil one, the sons of the devil, or the sons of God. It's that simple. And they grow together until the harvest. Okay. What is that context before we move into the harvest and revelation? Because I think it throws a lot of good light on here. Okay. Land Revelation 14, 15, and 16 is the harvest of the earth. Then another angel came out of the temple and called in a loud voice to him who was sitting on the cloud. Take your sickle and reap, because the time to reap has come, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So he who was seated on the cloud swung his sickle over the earth, and the earth was harvested. Yes. So remember that first angel of the first three that were flying in midair? It was a call to worship. Now we see the first of these second three. There's now another angel comes out of the temple to harvest those worshipers. <laughs> Isn't this interesting? There's some parallelisms going on right here in this chapter. Now he's going to, they're going to reap the, the, the harvest of the earth is taking place. Those first fruits are gathering in the, into the one crop, the one measure, the wheat, the harvest. <laughs> okay. So he called in a loud voice to him who was seated on the cloud. Take your sickle. So who reaps? Who reaps the harvest? In Jesus. Sense? Jesus. Jesus gets his harvest. Oh my, I'm getting my harvest. And I believe at the coming of the Lord, it seems that we'll be, we will be caught up and there will be a resurrection. And remember the note of the just and the unjust, but the righteous, the, the dead in Christ will rise first. And then we who are alive will remain, will be caught up to meet him in the clouds. But I believe once that happens, we're with him and then the judgment falls on the earth it seems like in the mm -hmm. bible kind of that's how it happens because we're out of here before the judgment falls we're with him and then mm -hmm. we, i believe we're gonna be able to watch and see the creation of the new heaven and the earth new earth i believe he's gonna so it the secret rapture kind of confuses the judgment with the persecution 
gives the idea we're out of here before persecution rather than out of here before final judgment. We are out of here eventually. Yeah. They, everything that they, that, that group teaches, if you go and read the context, it's all about the coming. Every single passage I've ever heard them share. It's all about the second coming. It's talking about the harvest. That being said. <laughs> you can ask questions. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> if necessary. <laughs> questions are important. I'll save it for later. <laughs> uh -oh. and that being said, you know, my husband who died is now in heaven. And now you've got the harvest and God is calling the harvest i mean do those people come down climb in their bodies and get i have a hard time with going directly to heaven because it eliminates the resurrection you want the middleman i i just get confused no, it's, no there's still a resurrection of your physical body there he is mm -hmm. there's is that it patty part of that has to do with understanding spirit soul and body okay a lot of this, a lot of the church is dual believes in a dual nature of man. That's a fallen nature of man is dual nature, but we were created triune, spirit, soul, and body. If you go back to Genesis three, and we discussed this quite a bit when we talked about the creation yeah. of man. And but I think that when man, what died, I believe this, from what I can tell contextually, what died the day that adam ate of the tree of knowledge of good and evil something he says in the day you eat thereof you will certainly die and i take that as god saying that personally it seems to me something died that day they definitely they became naked and they weren't they were naked and not ashamed before and now they're naked and ashamed so something changed in them what was it there was something in them internally that changed and they get themselves some fig leaves and they try putting these fig leaves on and God comes walking in the garden and they're still feeling naked. They have something externally on them. They still have their body. They still have their mind. But what has changed that makes them feel naked? Spirit. The spirit has died. Under so God. this text is strictly about the physical body? This is about the harvest coming together that this mortal's putting on immortality. It's a, I believe that right now, Brad's spirit is in heaven because that is immortal. When it, if you have the spirit of God, Jesus had to give up his spirit before he could even physically die. But it never talks about the spirit coming back into the body for well this well, remember remember it says that we are to save souls our soul is saved it is preserved our mind our memory when jesus has saved souls he's mm -hmm. saving you so when your physical body dies your soul is still saved it's still you he has saved it and then there's the spirit that but the spirit gets, is goes back real you him is your spirit it's your spiritual it's in the old testament you don't have the spirit it's right. external he makes it really clear in john 7 that that spirit could not yet be given because the firstborn had not yet been glorified you see jesus came out of the tomb he could his glorified body he could go through a wall we don't have a glorified body he, he could show up with the door shut i don't understand how that happens the only thing that makes any sense with it is some of that quantum physics <laughs> somehow which is way beyond my understanding <laughs> you know but so, he can show up so during this event this specific text what actually is taking place well actually quantum, quantum actually, physics <laughs> actually the bodies are resurrected glorified and the spirits come you know, it's interesting. Let me just give you a couple things. I know we're getting diversion. It's okay that we don't have to discuss it today. No, I just need a clarification that this was a, this was, this is talking about the righteous being where the righteous. Yes, it is. Uh, the harvest is the righteous from the very get go to the very end. And but they're not all on the earth. No. 
but their bodies are even cremated. Their bodies are still down here. Still here. In uh -huh. heaven, you might get visions of somebody up in heaven and you see them in a body. That's just a vision of it because believe I, I it says for the, in Ephesians 3, 14, for this reason, I kneel before the father from whom his whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name that ties with the name in the forehead. So there's some of his family in heaven and some on earth, but their bodies, it's their spirit because it's the only eternal thing. There's very, yeah, and I don't even know what that looks like when it says Jesus saves your soul. He's saving who you are, your mind. That's your mind, your thoughts is your soul. And the the word divides soul and spirit. So this is a whole nother study. But um sorry to interrupt it. I <laughs> I just, you know, I used to think that this was the resurrection of the righteous. And it is the resurrection of the righteous, their bodies. That has not changed. That has not changed. But because God is God, he can just do whatever he wants, how he wants to do it. That's how I think. Fair, fair enough. But, there is any, <laughs> okay. but this is a resurrection of their bodies, yes, literally. Okay, yeah. That's yeah. What I, that was my question. But it's a glorified body. Okay. Yes. This mortal puts on immortality. This mortal puts on and this this corruption puts on incorruption. So Bev won't have wrinkles anymore. Thank God. Okay. Anyway. Yeah. Okay. This, yeah, be with Christ. I'm ready to move forward. I'm just it's sorry. Forward. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah. It's ten minutes diversion, so it'll take us ten more minutes to finish. Okay, but it's okay. You can fast forward if you're if you're watching this, folks, on YouTube. <laughs> you're welcome to. We do not edit our conversation, so you get to hear it all. <laughs> or you can fast forward and get up further up back in Revelation again. It's okay. Okay, where were we? Uh, we had the uh, harvest of the earth. So the earth is ripe. What is the meaning of the earth is ripe? fullness of time fullness of time time yeah the fullness of time has come and we see this also alluded to in revelation 7 remember hold back there's four angels at the four corners of the earth hold back the winds from blowing any winds from blowing on the land or on the tree or on anything on the earth until we seal all of god's people the them, them in their foreheads he wants a full harvest he knows when everybody has made their decision that's ever going to make their decision for Christ. God knows that. There comes a point at the end that that's part of the reason for the wickedness to be revealed. The man, the son of perdition, the man of lawlessness to be revealed. Because when evil is fully revealed, people are either looking up or succumbing to the evil. Because there will be people alive at the coming of the Lord and people in Noah's day had to make a decision. People in Lot's day had to make a decision. Are they going to leave Sodom? Or are they going to laugh and say that's a falsehood? Like the, some of Lot's future son-in-law is going to say that. Are they going to ridicule Noah and not get in the ark? You see, at the, when there's an the actual judgment falls, there's a decision being made. When they went in and judged Jericho, People had a choice to get in Rahab's household or not with a scarlet cord was hanging out the window. So there's going to be a final decision making. So the earth is ripe. The harvest is ready. And now they're sealed. Now the winds can blow. So, <clears throat> okay. He swings his sickle and in an instant, the earth is harvested. <laughs> the resurrection happens, the glorified bodies, and we will be in our glorified bodies at that point at one time together. <laughs> okay. The hour of judgment on the wicked. Okay. Okay. Um, Patty, Revelation 14, 17. Okay. And Tim, Revelation 14, 18. We'll wind this down. Are you ready yet? Yes, go for it. Revelation. Another angel came out of the temple in heaven, and he too had a sharp sickle. Okay, so here's the second angel. Remember the second angel in the beginning? He had an announcement of doom on Babylon. Now, the angel of judgment is poised to strike. 
see how the parallelisms are happening the first three angels to the last three angels in this thing? This angel comes out of the temple in heaven, the angel of judgment. And he too had a sharp sickle. Okay, Tim, read Revelation 14, 18. Then still another angel who had power to destroy with fire came from the altar. He shouted to the angel with a sharp sickle, swing your sickle now to gather the clusters of grapes from the vines of the earth, for they are ripe for judgment. Okay, okay. So here we got the second angel. We talked about it. Um, the third angel, remember the third angel on the first three angels? He made a declaration of the judgment on the wicked. Now, this this another angel, now the judgment on the wicked is being poured out. See how they relate to each other, the first three angels and the last three angels in this, the parallelisms right in this chapter of Revelation. And he makes a declaration of the judgment on the wicked. Now the judgment of the wicked is poured out. Another angel who had charge of the fire. Fire represents what? Judgment. He had charge of the fire. Came from where? The altar. What does the altar represent? Worship. Sacrifice. Sacrifice. Yes, the place of the sacrifice. Remember, it's all about whether or not you believe in Jesus, the lamb all about the sacrifice have you washed your clothes in the blood of the lamb you have the white robe of his righteousness he calls in that loud voice to him who has a sharp sickle take your sip sickle gather the cluster gather the cluster of grapes from the earth remember back in the tears bundle up the tears in, in matthew 13 bundle the tears together gather all the grapes you're getting it ready to go someplace okay that's gathering of the and mm. Contrast from the earth's vine. Contrast Jesus, the true vine in John 15. Jesus is the true vine, the true wine, the new wine at the marriage of Canaan, <laughs> his first miracle, the wine of the marriage of the supper of the lamb. So the grapes from the earth wine, they're sour. <laughs> they're sour wine vinegar, you might say. Did you notice in John 19? I can't help but bring a couple of things about Jesus. And as we go along, Jesus took the wine vinegar. He said, I thirst right before he died in John 19. And they brought him on a stick, on a hyssop, and put it on the sponge and dipped it in the wine vinegar. And he took that wine vinegar so we don't have to. He became sin so we don't have to. And immediately then he said, it is finished and he died. He gave up his spirit. He gave his spirit back to God so he physically actually could die. <clears throat> so the grapes from the earth's vine are ripe. What does that mean? Ready. But yes. It's the time of fullness. The cup of iniquity is full. Contrast the harvest of the earth from every nation, tribe, people, and language of God. Revelation 7. Gail, could you read Revelation 14? 19 to 20 and then we'll have lynn read revelation 19 15. the angel swung the angel swung his sickle on the earth gathered his great its grapes and threw them into the great wine press of god's wrath they were trampled in the wine press outside the city and blood flowed out of the press rising as high as a horse's bridles for a distance of 1,600 stadia, stadia, stadia. However you pronounce it is probably right because I have no idea. <laughs> now the Greek word stadia, I don't know. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's break this down. Just, and this is, this is, we're closing down now here. Uh, the angel swung a sickle and gathered the grapes. The clusters of grapes from the earth vine. Uh, <clears throat> threw them where? Wine press. The wine press of God's wrath. And they become, when you're in a wine press, what happens? The grapes become that wine, don't they? And wine is symbolic in scripture often of what? Blood. 
Think about us drinking the wine at the Lord's Supper. This blood, this wine is my blood. This is my, takes the cup. This is my blood of the new covenant shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. I remember Jesus in Isaiah 63. If you want a very interesting passage, we won't read it. Isaiah 63, one to six. It says, Jesus tread the wine press alone. There was no one to save him. He has blood spatters. He comes from Edom. Remember Esau and Edom? <laughs> he comes from Edom, Adam. <laughs> and he's spattered with blood on his garments because he's been treading the wine press alone. He tread the wine press alone in order to save us from being tread upon in a wine press. Revelation 19, 15, Lynn. Uh, uh, this is the coming of the Lord. Jesus riding on his white horse. We're going to see it again in Revelation 19. I love the passage. Revelation 19 is powerful, but it relates to this. So would you read Revelation 19, 15? We will hit it again one of these days. We'll see it again. Out of his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. See, the winepress is the wrath of God being poured out upon the clusters of the earth. Wow. Where is it? Uh, the angel and the threat. They are trampling the winepress. Where is the winepress? Outside the city. Outside what city? The New Jerusalem. That's right, Patty. The New Jerusalem. That's, Why? that's the only city left. <laughs> there's no city <laughs> left. That was all left. Well, there's that. <laughs> yeah, we're in the city. <laughs> but wait, when it's outside the city, what's what's what what? When people had to go outside the city, some they what is it? Is a place of being unclean. Yeah, the Gentiles were unclean. They had to stay outside. Yeah. Wasn't and there a crucifixion outside of the city? Huh? The crucifixion was outside the city. Again, mm -hmm. that was my next point. You just made the next point. Where was Jesus crucified? Outside Jerusalem. <laughs> uh, on the Day of Atonement, they cast lots on these two pure goats. They were pure goats. No defect. One was the blood of the goat for a sin offering in the most holy place on the, and on the altar. Did you notice that? Jesus ascended on high, the most holy place, heaven itself, and on the altar where the saints are under the altar. We saw that in Revelation 5. Was it 5 or 7? I don't know, 6. I don't remember. <laughs> the fifth trumpet, wherever that was. <laughs> 7, I think. It was. It's Revelation. Seven. Okay, Revelation. Somewhere in Revelation. <laughs> Or Jesus was crucified outside the city because it's the unclean place. You see some parallelisms to our Savior. And the, the scapegoat who bore, they confessed all the sins on the scapegoat, then that live goat, they put it all on the scapegoat, on that live goat, <laughs> confessed their sins of omission and and even their sins of rebellion against God, all of them on the head, of the high priest lays both hands, both hands on the scapegoat. Scapegoat means they, they take your punishment instead of you. You know, you being the scapegoat, you take somebody else's punishment. Okay. And he bore all the sins on his head. He's taken outside the camp to the desert. And we see the desert, the solitary place, to a solitary place. And he's by himself in the desert. The desert, there's no water there. It's a place of death outside the camp. And then the, the camp was clean. Inside the camp, it's clean and holy. Interesting that Day of Atonement, how it represents Jesus and what he did for us. And the blood outside the press was as high as the horse's bridles. When do we see the horses? The sixth trumpet 
where they those locusts had morphed in those into horses and they're killing people right and left two ten two times ten thousand nine ten thousand horses remember we talked about all that going out there the mass deceiving the nations killing people getting them all on their side that was deceiving all the wicked the end times it's a final thing what the second third coming so when it refers to the blood flowing out of the press as high as the horse's bridles, horses can't be going anywhere if the, if the water is up to the bridles. That's clear for the mouth, isn't it? Where the bridle is right here? Mm -hmm. In other words, they're stopped in their tracks. They're going to die in it. That's the kingdom of this world represented by those horses riding out there. And the distance the blood flowed was 1,600 stadia. 1,000 means what? Okay, let's break down the numbers. Symbolism. Fulfillment. 10 to the third power. The test is over. <laughs> yeah, it's fulfilled, yeah. For the wicked, 10 times 10 times 10. Remember? 1,000 years, we're going to get into that again. But from the cross to the coming, the test, it all ends. The coming. And for the wicked is death. And we get the 600 in there, so we know what this is talking about. They have to know who this is about. 600, 10 is again the test. 10 times 10, and 10 times 10 is a full test of mankind. That's number six. This is a full test of mankind. The final test. This is the end of the world. This is the test of mankind. And then stadia. That is a Greek word, 4712, which means stadium. Guess what it means? A stadium. Stadium. Where they do their race course. <laughs> you have the races. Everybody looks on as the race is being happening, as things are happening. Their race is over. This is their destiny. This it was also 600 feet, a stadium. When I looked it up to see, interesting, it referred, to, re referred to the stadium. Yeah, it 600. said six hundred feet. Yeah, <laughs> they make a stadium be six hundred feet in our in our. They must have seen something about this in Revelation <laughs> sixteen hundred stadium. I didn't look it up. I wanted to know what it meant. <laughs> mine, said, mine said the sixteen hundred stadium came to one hundred and eighty miles. Yes, oh. yes. Uh, it says or one hundred and eighty miles. Yeah. <laughs> And I just have to say, it doesn't really say that in the Greek. <laughs> Mine doesn't say it in here. It doesn't say 180 miles, but I think in the in or newer NIVs, it probably says 100. It says that's about 180 miles, about 300 kilometers. <laughs> so what you know, one stadia is? Uh, what? No, a 1600. Stadia. Oh, 1600. Okay, great. Right. It's about 300 kilometers, 180 miles, but that's not the significance. Then you're, then you're making the blue be, what is this Navy or is it uh, royal blue in the flag? Okay. I mean, it's an interesting thought, but we miss the point of what it's saying here. So what we want to stick to is the meaning of the symbol and not get caught up in it translated into Royal English. Blue would sound more political and Navy would sound more militaristic. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> Crazy symbolism can get people mixed up, you know. But I wanted to explain something. The, the stadium's a race course where everybody's watching the race. And the third, compare the third woe, the final destiny of the wicked is hailstones falling on the wicked to death. <clears throat> Let's contrast the holy city just for curiosity. It is 12,000 cubits. Uh, no, 12,000 stadia cubed. Same word. <laughs> 12,000 stadia cubed. 12 times 12 times 12 is what? 144,000. There you go. <laughs> my, 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 my. 
And that's the eternal destiny of the 144,000, is the holy city, which is 12,000 stadia, as high and as long as high as it is. You know, you read it in Revelation 21, 16. Don't you just love this eternal life, eternal death of the wicked? But this stadia, this stadia, this course is run. And as we're looking at it, it is a holy city. In fact, they have their name of the holy city written upon their foreheads as well as the fathers and the lands. I just have to stop. I have to read the final text. I hate to do this to you. No, I don't hate to do this to you all. I love to do this to you all. I'm taking the final text. It's the Thessalonians, which it says in 1 Thessalonians 1, that they're loved by God in spite of severe suffering. They welcomed the gospel message. Read 1 Thessalonians 1. They were a model to all the believers who said this, and the model believers said this about them. Those people will tell you how you, they will tell how you turn to God from idols. This is verse nine, the second half and 10. They tell you how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead. That's an important point. It proved that he is the son of God. Jesus, in case you missed the point, who rescues us from the coming wrath. Oh, I, Jesus, I just give you all the glory. When I think about you treading the wine press, when I think about you bearing the cup of God's wrath in my place, you rescued me. And everyone sitting here who believe in you, we all believe in you, we're brothers and sisters in Christ. You've rescued us already from the coming wrath because you bore the wrath of God for us on the cross. We wanna just praise you and give you all the glory and say worthy is the Lamb who was slain from the foundation of the world to receive all honor and all glory and all praise forever and ever. Amen and amen.